Hello and welcome back to Data Science CastNet. In today's video, I thought we'd take a look at evolutionary optimization of model merging recipes from the Sakana Lab, a relatively new AI research lab in Japan, led by David Ha and friends. Um, a lot of really interesting researchers and they seem determined to go in a different direction to many of the big foundation model labs. Um, and so, yeah, they're all about swarm intelligence and uh, biologically inspired things, evolutionary algorithms, artificial life, lots of exciting topics. And so this is the first project. I think it's only been a couple of months since they raised um, their first round of seed funding. So impressive to have a paper out already. Um, and this one is just diving into this idea of model merging. So in today's video, what we'll do is we'll go through this paper, but we'll also use it as an excuse to look at what is model merging? What are some of the existing techniques that people do? How is this paper different? We'll dive into some of the actual evolutionary algorithms used. Um, yeah, and just use it to get a feel for the space as a whole. Now, I myself am a bit of a skeptic when it comes to model merging, and we'll talk about why that is too. Um, but for now, let's look at the paper, and we'll use this um, just as we're going through to launch into these other topics. Okay, so starting at the abstract, we present a novel application of evolutionary algorithms to automate the creation of powerful foundation models. So they say model merging has emerged as a promising approach for LLM development, right? This is taking existing models and combining them somehow. Um, but this at the moment relies on like human intuition and domain knowledge. It's very arcane. Um, I think in the introduction they call it out. Uh, it's considered by many to be a form of black art or alchemy, right? So this is this somewhat arcane new field. Um, and so they want to come take an evolutionary approach that gets over this requires human automate, uh, sorry, human um, intuition and instead have something that's more automatic and more um, generic and useful without having to have this black alchemy. Um, so they're going to talk about this approach that they have. They say they're going to do things both in parameter space and data flow space. So we'll make sure to look at what those two um, options are. Um, they say we're optimizing beyond just the weights of the individual models and this approach facilitates cross-domain merging. And so that's the big theme of this paper. We're not just taking two math models and smashing them together to get a slightly better math model. They're going to combine a Japanese model with a math reasoning capability, so two separate domains. And then they're also going to extend this even further to create a culturally aware Japanese visual language model by combining one model that understands images and one model that's trained on a lot of Japanese data and combining them um, to get a model that understands both of those domains. So very much uh, cross-domain merging is the, is the focus here. Can we use multiple models with different talents to combine together and get something that's uh, greater than the sum of the parts or that at least combines those talents? Um, cool, so they say this gives us some new state of the art models, but also it's a new paradigm. And they're very excited about this idea of having many, many different models that have different uh, capabilities and skills and then being able to merge and combine them with this evolutionary approach. Okay, so what is model merging? Um, these citations here are for the recently released merge kit. Um, this has been something that's fairly recently become popular in the LLM community, um, combining say two variants of an existing model together. Um, but it's something that has been around for a while in the uh, diffusion and, and image generation, cap uh, sorry, image generation fields, right? So with stable diffusion, and they, they do talk about this in the paper, um, you've seen a lot of people combining, oh, this maybe this one's uh, some model trained on some specific style, and then they have like a, a fine tune or a low rank adapter, like a LoRa for some other character or concept, and they smoosh the two together to get something that understands both. And so you've had these, um, these UIs, these interfaces that let people combine these models in different ways, and you can have different weightings, right? Maybe I want 0.9 of this base model, but 0.1 of this model that's better at I don't know, anime cat ears or whatever the really specific subject that the person wants. Um, and so a lot of the most popular um, stable diffusion based models for a while have been these big mergers where someone takes one that's trained really well on photorealistic images and another that's trained really well on really good fantasy images, maybe another that's trained really well on, I don't know, human anatomy and they, they mash them all together. Um, so this has been something that's been done for some time. And then going back even further, this model soup work, um, this was a paper back in the image classification days that said as long as you're starting from the same initialization or maybe something that's been trained a little bit, um, then you do multiple different training runs and you just average the weights, just linearly average all of the weights. 
and you get a better model. Um, so this was like, you know, drawing from the intuition around ensembling and things like that, but there was a lot of like debate at the time, I remember this, what is going on? How does this even work? A lot of people saying, oh, you know, you've got to think about each individual one mostly sort of fits the true distribution of the data, but has these weird spikes and overfitting. By averaging them all together, we're like flattening the lost landscape, and this is some sort of theoretical improvement. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of work around like, can we use this to ensemble? Is this efficient for training? Um, but this is kind of like separate to the more recent, oh, you know, I want to like, have explicit outcomes that I'm looking for. I take one model that's good at pencil drawing and one model that's good at the celebrity and I specifically combine them to get good pencil drawings of that celebrity. That's a more recent trend. Um, okay, so that's the that's the setting the scene, right? We're trying to mush these models together somehow. Um, and so we'll talk about some of the approaches, but then we should also look at what this paper is contributing, which is to say, um, we're gonna do this in an automated way rather than just uh, hoping for the best or having to understand like maybe what the models are each good at and hoping that the combination is good. Um, Cross-domain merging, so not just very similar things, but transferring very disparate sets of skills. Um, they're going to result in say the upper performance, they say, and we'll check that that's in in indeed the case. Um, generalizability and efficiency, so we're not spending too much time when we could actually just be, you know, maybe training a better model. No, this is going to be faster somehow. Um, and yeah, they're going to, at the end of it, have this cool, culturally aware VLM that's um, better than any of the existing ones. Um, okay, so I guess we should talk about how the model merging happens and look into some of the backgrounds there. Um, so they mentioned that um, linear or spherical linear interpolation, right, literally just taking some weighted sum of the weights, um, has been a popular approach. Um, but then for language models, there's a few more recent works. So we can take a very brief look at each of these. Um, this task arith arithmetic from last year was an early one. Um, the idea here is pretty simple. And the intuition is we have a base model, and then we've done a little bit of fine tuning for some specific task. If we look at the difference between the fine tuned model and the base model, we get this like this delta. And this is gonna be a direction in weight space that shows us getting better at this particular task, right? So they say, oh, we've got this task vector. This is a direction, this is a, a difference. So if I take my base model and I add this task vector to the weights, I hopefully get something that's better at this task. And they say, oh, we can actually um, have multiple of these task vectors and we can combine them, right? So I could say I want 0.7 times my math task vector, so I get a little bit better at maths, and 0.9 times my science question answering vector and I combine those two together and I get something that's hopefully good at science and maths. Um, and they explore doing different um, combinations there. Um, okay, so that was an early one. Again, this is very close to just like the linear interpolation slash linear combinations of weights. Um, so that was an earlier work. Then there's others that have um, attempts at improving that. And so one is this um, ties merging. And so here they make the observation that okay, it's all well and good to think of these deltas, um, these task vectors or whatever you want to call them, but when you have multiple different ones that interfere somehow, that's where you get a performance drop. And so they say, yeah, the existing methods often ig ignore this interference. We're going to try and get around this, um, either by eliminating redundant parameter values or disagreements on the sign. So their method trim, elect, sign, and merge this is going to do a few different things. One, if you have um, some parameters that have only changed by a very small amount, um, they're just gonna not make those changes. So the assumption is, I have my base model, I fine tune it a bit, some parameters are gonna change quite dramatically and these are gonna be the ones that are relevant to whatever task I'm training on. But then a lot of them might just move around a little bit just from random noise. So those we probably don't care and we should probably just reset them to the base model's value. Um, then resolving sign conflicts, okay, now I'm trying to combine three different models and two of them drastically increase this parameter and one drastically decreases that parameter. You know, how do I deal with that? Um, so that those are what they call sign conflicts where the direction is different and then merging only parameters that are in alignment with that final agreed upon sign. Um, yeah, so just trying to reduce these clashes where you have different updates pulling in different directions. How do we handle that? Um, this ties merging is one approach to handling that and they find that this does better than some of the previous methods. Um, 
been another work there is um and the reason I'm, I'm spending time on these is these two com together are what this paper we're looking at uses um so dare i think is called something like transformer models are super mario language models are super mario um absorbing abilities from homologous models as a free lunch it's a bit of a weird title it's a bit of a weird paper to be honest um but what they observe the observation is kind of interesting the whole paper is a lot of words around this one key observation and this technique and basically the technique is to randomly drop these delta parameters with a ratio and then to rescale the remaining ones so remember I said we have this direction from the base weights that are update we've, we've fine-tuned this model and we have maybe multiple of these models we look at the difference and that delta is like oh cool this tells us how to edit these weights um, this is saying oh if you only apply some fraction of those updates and you zero out the rest with some like random dropout you probably still get a lot of the benefit of that fine tuning. And in fact, they show that you can drop um, quite a high percentage of the parameter updates before you start losing performance. And so this is somewhat counterintuitive. Um, and later, if you go look at their tables and things, you'll see that the improvement from their approach versus more you know simple approaches is, is not huge, right? The numbers are always somewhat close together. Um, but it is interesting to think like, okay, what could this be telling us? And to me, part of what this hints is that there are these clashes. So if I have two fine tunes that maybe both add some skill and I'm trying to combine them together, there might be interference, there might be like um, reduced performance because of that interference. And so if I'm dropping out and only keeping 10, 20, 30% of each of those sets of updates, the overlap is going to be lower and the chance of those like destructive interferences is going to be lower. So maybe that gives you like a better result, not because it's actually better than if you could more intelligently combine them, but just because you have less of these weird clashes and conflicts. Um, and so, yeah, this almost talks back to um, some of you may have seen the video I did on zip lower, where they're trying to combine um, specifically lowers of diffusion models but they also had this issue of like oh some updates would be um, interfering with each other from two different lowers if they both had the same update you shouldn't just like naively combine them you should have some way of detecting um, or scaling or adjusting so that they didn't have those conflicts so I think the language model merging crowd um, could maybe benefit from some of the diffusion lower merging techniques and vice versa um, but this is all active research I know um, uh, yeah, I've spoken to, I think it was some, some of the people on this team. Um, yeah, and everyone's busy working on this and, and figuring out better and better ways to do this. Um, anyway, so that's how exactly we're merging these different models. And in this paper, they're going to use a combination of this dropping out some of those updates and then using the ties merging to say for the remaining ones, how do we actually combine them? Rather than just linearly combining them, we're going to do this, oh, check you know, zero out any that are really small, um, rescale appropriately, check the sign and only adjust if the sign agrees, that kind of thing. Um, okay, then there's one additional type of merging called Franken merging. And this is different. So everything we've talked up to until now has been, I have two models that are the same shape or two layers that are the same shape, and I'm somehow combining the weights from those two to give a new layer that's also that same shape. Franken merging has been around for a little while in the language model community and it's built on this intuition that um, each layer in these transformer models mostly passes through the data untouched and at best it makes small updates to that hidden state and so if you take layers 1 through 12 of a model then the data would normally go into 13 through 20 say um, but then you could s skip a few of those layers and jump straight to layer 17 and the data coming into that layer would look slightly different to what it's used to, but not that different, right? The the difference from the start of each layer until the end of each layer in the middle of these transformers is generally quite small. They're only occasionally making updates, and the intuition here is that it's only when something specific to that language model head and that layer that it's learned some particular fact or some particular pattern, then it's making an update, but otherwise it's kind of almost doing like an, a no-op, right? It's just passing on the data untouched or only tiny, a, a tiny bit adjusted. Um, and so Franken merging was built, built on that observation. It's like, oh, well, what if we then like stacked multiple uh, extra layers in there, right? So we take a model that was 30 layers, we expand it to be 50 layers. So it has the first 10 layers untouched, 
and it has two copies of the 11th layer, two copies of the 12th layer. Maybe um, the 13th and 14th layers are from a different fine tune of that same base model. And all of these different layers are shoved sequentially together to give you a deeper model. Um, and this is how you see like 128 or 120 billion parameter models based on a 70 billion parameter model or 10 billion parameter models based on 7 billion parameter models. People just duplicating layers or combining different variants of a given layer from different models, but not by averaging the weights, just by stacking them sequentially. So that's what they mean by Franken merging. And we'll see that this ties into their, um, when they talk about the data flow space versus the parameter space. Parameter space is going to be all the other kinds of merging where you're combining the weights. Data flow space is going to be uh, stacking more layers and changing the order of those layers. Cool. All right, that's a lot of background. <laughs> we can finally get to the method. And so their goal is to create a unified framework that can do both of these types of mergers and to give us a resulting model that hopefully surpasses any individual in the collection, right? So we want to combine multiple models together to get something that's even better. Um, so they're going to apply evolutionary algorithms and we can talk about that shortly. Um, and they're going to split this merging process into these two different spaces. Um, the merging by combining parameters and the merging by changing the data flow. So this diagram here is a nice overview. Here we have two models. These are our original models, both trained from the same base, but with different fine tunes on some different task. Um, and so you can see here, this model is the same shape as these two. Um, and each layer is some combination, but the weighting is different. So here it's mostly this first model, it's mostly blue. The second one is sort of a mix. The third one's mostly red. Um, but you can see the shape hasn't changed. It's just that the weights have been combined in one of these fancy um, merging techniques. The second model here is also a combination of these two, but instead of averaging the weights, all they've done is stacked some of the layers from one and then a layer from the second. Right. So now we have more layers in total, um, but each of the layers individually hasn't changed. So this has just changed in the data flow. It hasn't changed the weights of any given layer, um, but there's no reason we can't combine these. And so here they combine this model, which was a merge of the weights, plus an extra layer from one of the other models. So now we've also changed the data flow. And so, yeah, that's going to be their approach is going to be doing bits of both and combining them together and seeing which performs best. Um, now, yeah, at this point we can look at, um, so they're going to say we're enhancing ties mer merging with DARE, so they're combining those two techniques we looked at. Um, they're doing layer-wise merging, um, and they're going to optimize this with an evolutionary algorithm and guided by some task-specific metric. So we should talk about now what is evolutionary <laughs> computation, what, what is going on in this paper, um, because this is different to the kind of fine-tuning, training, gradient-based, um, differentiable uh, updates and training that you might be used to. This is going to be some different approach, and this is kind of one of the ways in which this lab is trying to be different to everyone else doing the same gradient-based approaches. So I'm going to switch to a different screen, um, and we're going to try and get an intuition specifically for this CMA algorithm. So this is... Um, what does it stand for? Covariance matrix adaption, um, evolutionary strategy, something like that. Um, but the core idea here is that we have multiple parameters that we're trying to optimize. So for example, um, oops, you can consider like, okay, we have some scale here and this could be the, um, the relative weight of model A versus model B in our merge. And we have some different parameter and this might be um, maybe this is like the um, percentage of the weights that we drop in the dare part of the merging, right? And we can have many more of these continuous variables that we're searching over. So there's different scalings for each layer and that kind of thing. So this is the space in which we want to search. And every point here corresponds to some output model, right? So this one could be like mostly model A versus model B. Um, and this is low density versus high density in terms of like how much am I dropping out? Um, I could also try this merge here. Um, so what this strategy does is says, okay, we're going to initialize a whole population of candidates. And the way we're going to do this is we're going to have some distribution in this search space, right? So I'll draw the distribution here with a little mean. And you can imagine the distribution being like spread around that mean. 
Um, and so our population is going to be samples that are more likely to be close to that mean, but scattered around. Um, and each of these is going to be some candidate that we evaluate, right? Now, you can imagine that some of these candidates might perform really well. Like these three here might get um, pretty good scores, and a few over here might get extremely terrible scores. So once we've picked a few candidates and we've tested them out, um, what we're going to do next in this algorithm is to say, let's select the good ones, right? So these candidates here, these all did pretty well. This is going to be like my survivors. Then I'm going to update the distribution that I'm using to search. So remember we had this distribution centered around the mean. I'm going to update this such that it's closer to the distribution of those survivors. Um, and so now I've got a new mean, right? It's not the mean of those survivors is some update step size. So I'm not going all the way, but I do have a new distribution. And that new distribution is closer to the part of this parameter space that produced those hopeful candidates. So now I'll sample some candidates from that uh, distribution. Again, some of them will do better than others. I'll pick the top scoring candidates. I'll update the mean. And we apply this again and again, um, as many steps as we like until we find some stopping criteria or we, we stop improving. Um, but the idea of this algorithm is that it lets us search this space, these continuous parameters. Um, but importantly, it lets us do it without any of this having to be differentiable. Right, and so we're not able to find a gradient like we would with the parameters of a neural network based on some like uh, differentiable loss. Instead, we're just using these random samples and then we're kind of like computing almost a pseudo gradient, right? Or some like direction in the space that might be useful, but we're continuing to sample lots of points randomly to get lots of exploration. And each of these ones, the evaluation of this candidate here this doesn't have to be differentiable. This could be like, oh, I then fed it a bunch of multiple choice questions and I looked at the accuracy. All that matters is that we can pick out what are the highest performing candidates. Um, yeah, so it's a pretty interesting algorithm. Um, and this is more broadly what evolutionary algorithms are really good at. It's like searching a really large space um, doesn't have to be continuous, can sometimes be like discrete. Um, none of the uh, the outcomes have to be differentiable. There's no gradients flowing. It's more like seeing which ones work and which ones don't in some like population that we generate, and then somehow um, updating our parameters that we're searching over to try and find the best combination of parameters. And so in this case, um, for the parameter space merging, those parameters are referring to like the weighting and so on of how exactly we're combining these different models. Um, yeah, and we can look at now what is the equivalent for the data flow space. Um, recent analysis implies that knowledge is stored distributedly in language models. I thought this was a very interesting observation and a very interesting paper that it links to. Um, so yeah, I'll leave this mostly for as an exercise for the reader. Um, but this is feeding into that idea I spoke about earlier of like, why would stacking layers one above the other out of the order they were originally trained? Why would that even work? And the intuition is that, yeah, they're activated on like specific facts or specific patterns and only then are they making updates to the distribution of likely tokens. Um, and a lot of the time the residual that's passed, it's not going through, you know, there's some path that goes through the layer and there's some path that goes directly on and they're combined and the path that's being fed through the, the feed forward or the attention head, um, that part is like a modification, a delta, and those are sometimes small um, and sometimes large, and these um, the, the, the key intuition is that they sort of stack. Um, and if we could stack more layers that maybe had more general knowledge, that might not be a terrible thing. Anyway, um, slight diversion, but this is kind of giving some justification for why this data flow um, tweaking might even make sense. So we just talked about evolutionary algorithms being able to search this parameter space and try different combinations, that's great. Um, but it's not a magic bullet, and one of the issues is that you can sometimes end up with a space that's just too vast to explore. And that's the case if we consider this um, data flow merging technique where we want to get up to t layers, right? So I have two models that have 32 layers each, and I want to create a new Franken merge that's got 40 layers. If I've got n different models that I'm choosing from, um, and I could have lots of different layers in each of those models, and I could stack them in any order, 
the search space is vast, right? I could choose any layer from any model for any layer in the final model, just way too many different options to explore. And so this, even if you had a really good evolutionary search, um, would just be like kind of way too computationally intensive or even impossible. So to try and do that, this paper is saying, how can we reduce the search base down? And they come up with a, a somewhat interesting, but somewhat hacky approach, which is to say, okay, we will have a fixed ordering where we'll take um, all the layers in sequential order. So we're never going to do something where we have like layer seven, then layer six, then layer five, then layer four, then layer three. We're kind of going to assume that they should probably go in roughly the order that they were added, um, but we're going to repeat them. So I'll have layers one through 30 of, of model one, layers one through 30 of model two, layers one through 30 of model three. Then I'll do layers one through 30 of model one again, and same for two and three, and then some number of repeats. So maybe you have three repeats. Um, and so we have all of the layers in this kind of like somewhat sequential order with repeats. And then the only thing that I'll be able to learn is whether to include any given layer or not. This indicator here is like a, if this is above one, we include the layer. If it's below one, we don't. Um, and so now instead of having to have all possible orderings, we just have for this long list of sequential but repeated candidate layers, we just have a one or a zero or a, a number of like whether or not this should be included um, for every like index in that list. And so now we've reduced it to two to the power of t options versus um, m plus one to the power of t. So a much smaller space. Um, and there's one extra nuance, which is that, okay, so we're optimizing this i, we're trying to pick different configurations of this, you know, include or not um, array. Um, they find that if you just do that, it's not ideal. There's some problems with jumping straight from layer seven to layer 12. Um, they want to do more theoretical analysis of this, but for now they say, well, we find that practically it helps to do some scaling as well. So if I'm um, choosing different layers from different parts of the model and I'm putting them in order, um, what I should do is probably scale the input by some weight and these weights are also going to be something that we optimize. right? So instead of just having the yes or no indicator array, we're also going to have this W array that we're optimizing during this evolutionary search process as well. Um, and there's ways to make it even smaller. Um, okay, so that's the that's the framing here. So the first one was a lot easier to visualize. We're just changing the weights with which we're merging, and that's parameters that we can search over using this evolutionary search. Um, the second one, there's some trickiness around trying to make the search space manageable. So they have this particular types of ordering, this um, inclusion index um, thing, and then this weighting. Um, but these are still just parameters that we can vary according to some distribution, and then we can evaluate the candidates by actually doing the merge and seeing how well it does. Um, and then we can update the parameters that we're searching and we can try a new set of, a new population. Um, yeah. Okay, so they took, they say these are orthogonal approaches. In other words, they're both useful, but we can combine them together. Um, and so they're gonna do first one and then the other. Um, and then they also talk about um, being able to apply this with multi-objective genetic algorithms. This, as far as I know, they don't actually do much of in the paper, um, but if you're curious, this here is an algorithm that lets you take multiple different objectives, right? So maybe I want to do good on math questions and science questions and Japanese uh, cultural questions or something like that. Um, if we are exploring the space of possible model mergers, maybe some are better at one of those and some are better at another, we're really interested in, like, I want to know the models that are decent at all of them Maybe some are more good at one and some are more good at another, but I want that kind of, that Pareto frontier, right? Um, and that's exactly what this kind of algorithm is good at, is saying like, okay, well, here are some combinations that are worse than other combinations on all of those things. And here are some that are kind of like as good as each other and maybe better in one metric or another. So these are like the candidates that we'd really care about. And then we can choose those trade-offs of which skills do I particularly value. Um, but yeah, we can have this like multi-objective thing coming in. Anyway, small side note. Cool, that's a lot of background. Um, thank you for bearing with me. I think now we can get into the results. So we've talked about how they're doing this. They're doing this evolutionary search over these merging parameters. Um, we should now answer the important question of, does this actually work? And so to try this, they're gonna set things up with a Japanese model. 
Um, by the way, all of these are based on the Mistral 7B model. Um, so they have a Japanese LLM, and then they have two math LLMs, neither of which is trained on Japanese. They're all trained from the same base model, um, and then they're going to test these on Japanese math questions. So they have a translation of a grade school math question data set, um, and they're going to use that to say, can we get a model that's good at math in Japanese? And they're going to evaluate this on those math problems. Um, cool, okay, so they're doing that algorithm we spoke about, they're having some initial parameter values, so it's like a, a mean and a, dis a sigma, or a, a variance or a standard deviation, um, some population size, then they'll pick the best, they'll update the initial parameters to have a new mean and a new sigma, then they'll sample more a new population from that new distribution, and so on and so forth. Um, they're evaluating their candidates on some training samples, that are different from the test set. So they're saying, okay, I've got some different math questions in Japanese because um, I don't want to just train on the test set. I do a thousand trials, they take the best one um, as the final model. And then similarly for the uh, data flow stuff, they um, they line up all their candidate layers, they have some on and some off, and they do their optimization over that, and they end up with some combination of layers from different input models. Um, okay, and the key results the accuracy here, the general Japanese model was not so good at maths, the general maths model was not so good at Japanese, so neither of them do particularly well, but their mergers here all do fantastically, right? And so the merging just in the parameter space, combining these three models, that's what this means, one plus two plus three, combining these three input models, you get an upper model of the same size, just because this is parameter space only, but the accuracy is a lot higher because we've managed to hopefully take the Japanese skills plus the math skills, and we can now answer these Japanese math questions. Um, likewise for data flow, um, taking some layers of this math model and some layers of this Japanese model, it does work, right? We do get something that gets a little bit better than any of the inputs, um, but what's really even better than that is to say, ah, let's take um, some layers from our merge that we've combined in weight space and some from the general um, Japanese model and smush them together by reordering and that's where they get the highest performance. Um, so you can see there's the two types of merging here. This is the um, parameter space only, this is the data flow space only and then combining the two together by doing one and then the other that's where they get their highest gains and they now have a slightly larger model um, but it performs better um, and in fact it beats a lot of the existing Japanese models very handily um, and this is just another data set that they evaluate on and same thing so this is a good sign that it's not just this data set um, it extends to um, general Japanese abilities as well um, yeah so that's fantastic we get a, a better model out that's got both skills that we wanted um, just as you would have hoped would happen and they were able to do this without having to you know manually like guess at those scaling figures, instead they could use their search approaches. Um, okay, so that was nice. I like this figure, it kind of shows, if you look at which ones the math models get right, um, those tend to flow over into which ones the combined models get right. So it says, you know, um, this is kind of what we hope, that we're not just magically getting some new abilities, instead it's like the kinds of questions that some of the input models would get right, the kinds of questions that the merged models also get right and the kinds of questions that none of the input models can answer also none of the merged models really can answer um, cool uh, then okay um, I guess we can look at yeah you can see that all three input models have some weight and some density um, so they're all contributing um, likewise in the data flow um, they initialize things so that you get a lot of the early layers in order, this seems to be very helpful. Um, but then over the course of this uh, search, you end up with some new ordering. Um, you can see it's still in this like sequential with repeats setup, um, but different scalings. The size of these dots is the um, the weight matrix, this the scaling factor. Um, yeah, so we end up with a stack of layers, some from one model, some from the, the other model. That's the color, um, and this is an ordering that seems to help and give the best results. Okay, um, jumping up even further in difficulty, can we take a model that's been trained um, where we have a vision encoder, extracting image features, and then we're projecting these into the um, embedding space of this language model, and then the language model is 
um, learning to interpret these these are like non-word tokens you know these like soft prompts um, it's learning to somehow make sense of those and answer questions about those um, yeah so that's a very different domain to just general language modeling um, and so they use this lava model which is exactly that it's learning to take these these image embeddings and then some text embeddings as well to ask and answer questions about the image caption it and so on um, yeah so their question is can we combine this image understanding that's been added to this model with the Japanese understanding of our Japanese model. And so this is a very tricky task, right? This Japanese model has never been trained on any um, image inputs. Um, yeah, and so that's what they're going to try and do. They have some uh, question answering data sets and they create a new one. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, yeah, so they apply their technique, um, same as before doing parameter space and uh, data flow space merging. And yeah, shockingly and impressively, the result is something that does better than either the base vision model or the an existing Japanese um, vision language model that was trained specifically on this. Um, they get better results than both on both the existing data set and the, um, the new data set that they create, right? So you have to think about this for a little bit to appreciate it. This is a model that is merged from one model that doesn't really focus on Japanese, but that does focus on adding image understanding to the base model, right? Mistral wasn't trained on images, but this fine-tuned lava was. Then we have another model that was just fine-tuned on Japanese um, text and Japanese culture, and we're able to combine them to get something that's able to answer visual questions in Japanese with the appropriate context. Um, yeah, so very, very cool results. And nice to see that the way they do this is they just uh, apply our technique, right? There's no fine tuning and tweaking and trying different scales manually. It's just uh, we have a technique now that's able to like robustly take two input models and figure out an optimal weighting or at least a, a really good weighting using this evolutionary search. Um, yeah, so that's the core of this paper. The discussion and conclusions, you can see this is something they're very excited about. They have this idea of maybe like a whole swarm of different models out there in the world learning different things from different people um, and being able to like improve on these different subtasks and then their evolutionary techniques or other techniques able to like combine all of those individual small models together into some larger foundation model that has all of these capabilities um, yeah so you can see they have this really cool vision um, I do think this is a, a really nice paper I think this is a really nice approach especially combined or compared with some of the um, the existing work. So if you go back to the um, the merge kit citation, um, I don't have the browser tab open, but we can talk about that just briefly. Um, what was happening is that you'd have people looking at the leaderboard, the Hugging Face Open LLM leaderboard, and then they'd pick a couple of models on there, and then they'd merge them with this like easy one-click tool, and then they'd submit that for evaluation, and it might get you know a slightly higher score on the leaderboard, you know, and this was rinsed and repeated and rinsed and repeated to the point where you get some model which is a merge of two other models and each of those is a merge of two other models and those are merges from some base models and some initial models um, and so you have this whole like lineage this family tree of this model that's getting you know 0.1% better than some of the other models and so it's oh, it's the top of the leaderboard it's the best 7B model ever um, but several issues one you don't know whether any of those initial models had um, test set contamination I know some of them definitely do now everything that's a merge of one of those mergers of one of those mergers of one of those contaminated models, um, you're not sure if the performance is because it's actually good at the task or whether it just happened to be trained on some of the test set. Um, so you have this complication and then also you kind of have some overfitting, right? Because these are being evaluated on the leaderboard and then we're picking combinations based on which ones do well, evaluated on the same leaderboard again, picking which ones do well. Um, so you end up with something that does really well on that leaderboard, um, but that doesn't necessarily translate to does well on other tasks. Whereas the paper that we've looked at here, they're very careful to say, we have our evaluation set that we use for the evolutionary search, that's separate to the test set, and then we're also going to check, does this apply to other similar domains? Does this still have good knowledge across other Japanese tasks as well? You know, basically, is this something that's somewhat general versus just like, oh, we overfit to this very small test set, um, and then we call that good. So I really enjoy this paper. Um, Congratulations to the Sakana team. I'm looking forward to seeing what else comes out of this lab. Um, yeah, and I hope you've enjoyed this. Um, 
deep dive into model merging, evolutionary algorithms, and um, a really fantastic paper. Thank you so much for watching.